A mysterious client pays her lawyer with an exotic object. Maybe she was a spy. Maybe. It becomes his son's strange inheritance. It is quite a stunning piece to look at. Can he decode its past and unlock a fortune? It's the equivalent for us as Americans of owning something that may have been there with George Washington. Wow. Wow is right. A small town, an ancient emperor, and a puzzle. It was a three-week auction and nothing happened. And nothing, nothing happened. No bits? You're thinking that, my gosh, this is terrible. Oh, it's all out the window. I'm Jamie Colby, and today I'm visiting Townsend, Vermont, classic Norman Rockwell America. It's the kind of place where neighbors can still leave their doors unlocked and where a country lawyer can let clients pay them with food from their farm or dinners at a restaurant or gifts of some kind. In fact, that's how this strange inheritance story begins. My name is Paul Weber. My father was a lawyer in small town Vermont who was always willing to help a client out. And that's how I ended up inheriting a really cool and really old Chinese relic and a pretty strange story to tell. I meet Paul, a local math teacher, and his wife, Sarah, at their home. Come on in. Thank you so much. The residence doubles as a bed and breakfast the couple have run for almost 30 years. I couldn't help but noticing as I came in, you have a lot of exotic art. My father was always interested in Asian art and he dabbled in painting a little bit. And so that's why we have lots of things around the house. When Paul's father, Bruce Weber, wasn't practicing his painting skills, he was practicing law in nearby Brattleboro. What kind of attorney was your dad? Well, as a small town lawyer, you don't specialize. You do a little bit of everything. In the mid 1970s, a woman comes to Bruce in need of legal services. Whether she couldn't afford his fee or for some other reason, she offers him works of art instead of cash for his services. She had quite a collection, so I'm told, of Asian art. And my father was interested in that. And so his fee for the services was to receive these pieces of Asian art. How much was the fee? I have no idea. One of the items the mystery client gives Paul's father is this delicately carved piece of ivory. It's so intricate, I can actually make out the faces on the people. Right. This is a single tusk? This is a single tusk. Paul's father receives three more Chinese artworks in the deal. There was a small piece of jade carved into kind of a mountain scene. And there was also a feather headdress. But the most amazing piece was a table screen. And here it is. Screens like this have been used in China for centuries. A functional piece of art atop a desk. It blocks the wind and sun in an open air workspace. It had Chinese calligraphy on one side, and then on the other side, a pastoral scene of horses, all held in a bronze frame. My first question, who is this client of Bruce's? And how did these exotic items end up in small town Vermont? I really don't know anything about it. You must be curious. A little bit, but I don't know the woman, and I'm sure she's long gone now. She'd spent considerable time overseas, particularly in China. Maybe she was in the Foreign Service. Maybe she was a spy. Maybe. Were they displayed in your home growing up? Yeah. They were always conversation pieces because they're pretty unique. When Bruce Weber passes away at age 72, the artworks become Paul's strange and still mysterious inheritance. We tried to have the characters read by a Chinese teacher. She couldn't read them. In 1997, the couple sends photos of the items to Lark Mason, the vice president of Chinese art at the famed Sotheby's auction house in New York City to do an insurance appraisal. What was the Chinese art market like at that time? The Chinese art market was dominated by Western buyers who had a Western perception of what was valuable. 
Lark thinks those buyers will be most interested in the screen. He appraises it at ten to fifteen thousand dollars. A lot of money. Did you sell? Oh no, we weren't interested in selling at the time. We didn't send them down there with any other intention than just getting a, a up-to-date evaluation. So for the next decade, the artworks just sit in Paul and Sarah's home, helping decorate their bed and breakfast. But the couple will look at these curious relics anew when, on an overseas trip, their lives take a joyous surprise turn. We did not particularly want children, but I just told Paul, I don't think I can leave that child here. That's next. But first, our strange inheritance quiz question. The Chinese invented kites 3,000 years ago. Early ones were used for what purpose? To entertain the emperor's children, frighten enemies in battle, or celebrate the new year? The answer when we return. So what purpose did early kites serve in ancient China? It's B. Many were flown over enemy camps, meant to be interpreted as warnings from the gods to flee. Back in the 1970s, a small town Vermont lawyer named Bruce Weber does some work for a client and in lieu of cash, accepts four pieces of Chinese art from the mysterious woman. The artwork eventually becomes his son Paul's strange inheritance. This is a piece of history. Yeah, it is. This finely crafted table screen is appraised for $15,000, but Paul and his wife Sarah aren't about to sell. Mostly they were just pieces that reminded me of my father. Then out of the blue, life presents Paul and Sarah with something they neither sought nor expected in a place far from their Vermont home. It's 2005. They're on a volunteer trip to a rural village in northern Tanzania. What led to your interest in Africa? Well, I'm a teacher and I took a sabbatical originally to teach English. What was life like for the people there when you were there? It's a pretty tough life. There was no electricity at all, water by bucket. It breaks your heart. That's when a young boy named Leo steals theirs. Every single time we turned around, there was Leo. Sarah and I were walking down to watch a soccer game, and Leo somehow inserted himself in between us, and we were holding hands with Leo. And then we found out that uh, he was sleeping outside under a tree and was literally starving to death. We did not particularly want children, but I just told Paul, I don't think I can leave that child here. A year later, Sarah and Paul are finally able to bring Leo to the U.S. and then adopt him. Why'd you feel you had to do more? Because I could do more. The couple opts for private schooling so their son can get the individualized attention he needs. But that takes some serious cash. The amount we paid for private school was nothing that we ever had in our plans. It was a ridiculous amount of money. It probably averaged out for 15000 a year. The couple uses money Sarah had inherited after her father had passed away to fund Leo's education. But it only goes so far, and as their son reaches the end of high school with college on the horizon, Sarah and Paul find themselves running out of money and answers. What do you think that college education's gonna cost you? Well, you know, it could be about 50,000 times four. It's a lot of money to put a kid through college these days. Like millions of other American parents, Paul and Sarah start scrambling. They'll need somehow to raise more cash. Mortgage the B&B? &B? Maybe. But what about those puzzling Chinese pieces? I thought, well, you know, if they are worth 10000 that would be a chunk of change for college. In 2014, they tracked down Lark Mason, the man who appraised the items all those years ago. He's no longer at Sotheby's, but running his own auction house. I sent him pictures in an email, and he was very excited. 
Excited because, Lark says, a lot's changed since the 90s when he appraised the screen for 15 grand. That's appropriate to the time frame? For that time frame, yes, absolutely. China's economy has grown dramatically from the 90s up to the present days. There's a lot more people with money, with ability to buy things. Seems the swelling ranks of 21st century Chinese millionaires have shifted the market for Chinese art into overdrive. Two weeks later, Sarah drives down from Vermont and brings the artwork to Lark's Manhattan office. He said a headdress might go for a few thousand, and then the little carved piece of jade, that might get a couple of thousand. And that might cover Lieo's textbooks. But then there's the table screen. As before, Lark is most intrigued by it. The quality struck me, the workmanship, the design, all of it was just exactly what you'd want to see in an object that would be coming up for sale. And now that Paul and Sarah are serious about selling, it's time Lark zeroes in on the screen's past. Exactly when was it made? Where? By whom? For whom? The first clue, it's exotic materials. Gold, turquoise, coral, white jade. All that is something that not a normal person would have. So it comes together and you know it's special. Exactly. Another clue is how many different kinds of craftsmanship it displays. The people that were doing the bronze work, you had the gilders, you had the individuals that were coming up with the different sized stones here. You're looking at at least seven, eight, nine, ten different individuals involved in this. But who would have that kind of money to put into the materials even for this? A very important person. A very important person whose identity, Lark believes, lies hidden in its cryptic imagery and symbols. The mission to crack the screen's code. That's next. Here's another quiz question for you. In what city was the modern fortune cookie popularized? Tokyo, Hong Kong, or San Francisco? The answer when we return. So where was the modern fortune cookie popularized? It's C. The cookies were made famous by a Japanese-American immigrant who was the landscape designer of Golden Gate Park's famed Japanese tea garden. In the fall of 2014, auctioneer Lark Mason thinks that if he can decipher the imagery and writing on this antique Chinese table screen, he can unlock the value of Paul Weber's strange inheritance. And now the appraiser suspects it's directly linked to some important figure in Chinese history. What's on this side? This side depicts the eight horses of Wang Mu. Wang Mu was the fifth emperor of the Zhou dynasty who boarded a chariot in search of the peaches of immortality in heaven. According to the myth, each of his magical chargers had a special talent. One galloped without touching the ground, while another ran as fast as the sun's shadow. Now, Wang Mu ruled about a thousand years before Christ. Lark knows the screen is not that old. But the myth becomes a popular subject for Chinese poets and artists, and a symbol for the later emperors. But which one? Lark hopes the inscription on the other side holds the answer. His crack research staff soon has a translation of the ancient Chinese. What does it say? Well, the inscription is really interesting because it specifically mentions Qinlong. Emperor Qinlong reigned during most of the 18th century, which is why Lark is so excited by his next discovery. There's a date mentioned 30 years earlier in 1743 when I commissioned a painting about horses. So that takes us up to 1773 or so. Smack dab in the middle of Chin Long's reign. And so all that ties together here in this one screen. It's museum quality? Oh, no question. Really? Absolutely, no question. That hardly surprises the curator of Asian art at 
the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, which has on display a number of works commissioned by Chen Long. Was he a proponent of the arts? He was absolutely a patron of the arts, someone who was very involved in using art as a means of self-expression, as well as to legitimize and maintain his rule. Like this hand-carved piece of ivory used to hold paintbrushes. They're pretty fancy for putting in paintbrushes. It's a pretty fancy one, yes. Like most pieces commissioned by Chin Long, the brush holder tells a story. This is about a young scholar who was so gorgeous that when he went by, women pelted him with flowers. The detail is amazing. The number of people that look like they're on a balcony. Isn't that wonderful? Chen Long is revered in China today. He is the emperor to whom people look up as an example of the best of good government. So anything from this particular dynasty is considered very valuable? Very valuable. The equivalent for us as Americans of owning something that would have been there with George Washington. Wow. Wow is right. Betting that wealthy Chinese buyers will bid high for something that could have sat on Chen Long's desk. Mark jacks up his price a bit above his 15 grand appraisal in 1995. The table screen was now valued at between 60 and $90,000. Six to seven times more than 20 years ago. That's right. It was more than we make in a year for sure, <laughs> which to me was more than I could ever dream about. 90 grand. An elated Paul and Sarah know that will go a long way to pay their son's college bill. But Lark advises them to test the market by first selling one of the other pieces Paul's dad received from that long ago client. The result is positive. That jade piece that we thought would sell for about $1,000 ended up selling for $12,000. And, what? And we were really stunned. Tough to come up with the estimates in a very strong upward trending market. So then it became clear that we got to put this table screen in an auction. And then, just like that, the buyers vanish. It was listed on the featured items, but nobody bid on it. Will a family's hopes be dashed? Nothing happened, and nothing, nothing happened. Nothing? No bids? There were no bids. What's going on here? Or will their prayers be answered? Find out next. What's your strange inheritance story? We'd love to tell it. Send me an email or go to our website, strangeinheritance.com. Now, back to Strange Inheritance. In 2015, Paul Weber is trying to sell his strange inheritance, enigmatic pieces of Chinese artwork, to help fund his son's college education. It was a question of, you know, how are we going to come up with the money for him to go to college? His rare table screen, once appraised for $15,000, is now valued at up to $90,000 after the appraiser confirms its connection to the revered Chinese emperor, Chen Long. He is the emperor of emperors. He's exactly the one one wanted to have commissioned this object. In April 2015, the table screen is offered for sale in a two-week online auction. But despite being a featured piece, the screen is not an instant hit with bidders. It was at the top of the list, and nothing happened, and nothing, nothing happened. Nothing? No bids? There were no bids. I mean, two weeks anyway were gone, and we called and said, you know, what's going on here? On the final day of the auction, with just 30 minutes left on the clock, there is still no action on the table screen. It looked like nobody was going to bid on it at all. They were nervous. Auctions are horribly nerve-wracking because you're thinking that, my gosh, nobody's interested in this. This is terrible. Oh, it's all out the window. Finally, with just minutes to go, a flurry of bidding. There were two bidders that I saw that were going back and forth, and it just started climbing and climbing. The price jumps from zero to 60 in about five seconds well into the appraisal range, then surpasses Lark's high estimate. He sends the auction into overtime. It passes 200K. The final bid, 250,000 to a Taiwanese collector. You've got to be kidding me. I mean, it was like Monopoly money. 
What kind of difference will that money make for you, for Sarah, and for your son? It'll make a big difference. I'm really grateful that I'm going to be able to go to college. And I feel very grateful for what my future holds. Talk about a strange inheritance that ripples around the world. A piece of art crafted in a Chinese emperor's workshop somehow ends up in a small Vermont town two centuries later. It then travels all the way back to Asia, changing the life of a young man from Africa along the way. My father never knew Leo, and, and that's a little bit of a bittersweet thing. He would have thought there would have been nothing better to spend the money on than to give him an opportunity to extend his education. His grandson. That's right. I think for my father, it would have been the most meaningful fee that he ever received. The buyer of Paul's strange inheritance is a wealthy Taiwanese businessman on a mission to track down Chinese artworks around the world, buy them, and bring them home. He says he's thrilled about his newest purchase, both for its immense beauty and its great historical value. I'm Jamie Colby for Strange Inheritance. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, you can't take it with you.